Hello, and welcome to Entertainment Weekly's New York Comic Con panel on the state of black horror. I'm Entertainment Weekly writer Chancellor Agard, and today I'm talking to some of the filmmakers behind this fall's very exciting new horror films. Uh, joining us today are, uh, we have uh, Christopher Renz and Gerard Bush, director and writers of Antebellum, which uh, stars Hello, Janelle Monae. Entertainment Weekly's New York Comic Con panel on the state of black horror. I'm Entertainment Weekly writer Chancellor Agard, and today I'm talking to some of the filmmakers behind this fall's very exciting new horror films. Uh, joining us today are, uh, we have uh, Christopher Renz and Gerard Bush, director <laughs> and writer of Antebellum, which uh, stars Janelle Monae. Entertainment Weekly's New York Comic Con panel on the state of black horror. Hello. Multiverse! <laughs> it's Black Mirror! Run! Uh oh, are we there? Um, sorry, there was some technical difficulties. Uh, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll start again. Uh, today we have uh, Gerard Bush and Christopher Renz, directors and writers of Antebellum, which stars Janelle Monet as a modern woman who finds herself trapped on a 19th century slave plantation and is available on VOD right now. And we also have Justin Simeon, director and writer of Bad Hair, uh, which is about a young woman in the 90s who gets a killer weave, and that hits Hulu on October 23rd. Welcome, guys, and thank you all for joining us. How are you guys doing? Here. That was a fun time loop that we just went through. I feel bonded. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think we uh, I think we just lost uh, Bush and Renz briefly. Um, wow. Okay, this is looking like sabotage now. Like I'm getting rid of <laughs> everybody else. It's like old school. It's 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 like it's like old school horror movies. Yeah. <laughs> it's like people are dropping. There's <laughs> echoes happening. It's a lot. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much for joining us, um, Justin. I guess. Um, <laughs> I guess since we have you here first, I guess we will start with first a clip from um, Bad Hair, which again hits Hulu on October 23rd. Uh, if we could roll the clip. I thought so. I really do feel something. Clients swear this stuff is magic. You know, in some parts of India, a woman's hair is her most prized possession the greatest sacrifice she can make to her gods. <laughs> this came all the way from India? Forget about where it's from. Let's focus on where it's going. <laughs> <laughs> You're not tender-headed, are you? I'll be fine. And that was a clip from, again, just Justin Simeon's bad hair. Uh, Spoiler Justin. alert, they, she's really tender-headed, guys. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I guess with this movie, because I, 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 because I know uh, you said in the past we're inspired by sort of Korean and Japanese sort of hair horror films. I guess when you watch those films, what made you think that there was sort of a story that you could sort of take and make your own? Well, specifically, just the use of hair as a as a horror motif. Um, I thought that was really interesting. It's really effective. But I thought it was odd that, like, you know, there really wasn't sort of like an American version of that. Um, outside of a couple uh, shorts about male pattern bar baldness, which I didn't want to make a movie about. Uh, like, there's a, there's an episode of Amazing Stories called Hell to Pay. Uh, it's a toupee from hell. Um, but I felt like, you know, hair is an actual element of horror for black people. I'm not a woman, okay? I just tried to do the S-curl situation when I was in middle school. That was horrifying, okay? And uh, just sort of, you know, as a gay black man, um, you know, I was raised by black women. I see and saw what they go through just to like be, you know, on the radar of society. Uh, and, you know, to me, there was a lot that could be said uh, about that in a fun, entertaining, you know, movie that's fun and a little campy. I mean, it's a movie about a killer weave, literally, so we have to have some fun, uh, but also like really, you know, kind of shine a light on what is actually a horrific experience for a lot of people. Well, I'm, I'm glad you brought up the fact that this story is not only a black story, but a story about, it's a black female story. Uh, for you, I mean, and clearly you're identified as a man, I'm, I'm, what research did you do to sort of understand and get into that specific perspective like who did you talk to or what did you read or 
Just well, I was, I, I have a lot of trauma. So that was the first thing that was really <laughs> necessary to make a movie like this. Um, but, you know, when I when I kind of landed on the idea, because it started off as a little bit of a joke, but then I realized, like, I love, I love psychological thrillers. I love movies like Rosemary's Baby, where, like, you know, the premise is that a woman gives birth to Satan's love child. That's the literal premise of Rosemary's Baby. But when you watch it, it's actually about so much more. It's about the fragility of womanhood. It's about uh, the way men gaslight uh, the women that they supposedly care about. It's about these deep societal issues. Um, and I felt like I could graph that onto a movie, you know, about a killer weave. Obviously, the center of that movie had to be, in my opinion, a black woman. Uh, and so the very first thing uh, that I did is I, I literally gathered up every smart black woman in my life, uh, particularly in the film and TV industry. Um, and I treated them to, you know, some time in Palm Springs and we just kind of sat around and we talked. And I, I was very concerned about, um, one, getting the very specific horrors of their experience right, but also as a gay black man, not just sort of gay black manning all over it. Cause we're already in a camp territory. We're already in a B movie territory. Um, you know, it, the movie is already gonna have a little bit of that queer sensibility, but I wanted to make sure that like their actual experiences and concerns were in the movie. And, and frankly, like, you know, I tested it every step of the way, uh, whether we're in workshops or table reads or, cuts you know i i was very interested in, in in black women coming to the movie feeling like what i was saying in the film was true um but ultimately feeling you know respected by the movie and empowered by the movie and i want to bring uh christopher and gerard in on this uh for all three of you uh, i guess could you think, think think the horror genre has always been used to sort of engage with social issues over many years but for you guys i guess what do all of you sort of get out of the horror genre what, do, what draws you to it I think both movies could have told their story using different genres um, if they'd wanted to. Because what was it about horror that drew you all to this? And I guess I'm going to start with Gerard and Christopher. I mean, for us, we uh, we have a healthy respect just for the entertainment value of horror um, and and how uh, it can express itself in a variety of ways. And we thought that there was plenty of acreage uh, within the horror genre for us to hopefully uh, we achieve that with Antibone to, to push the envelope and to say that let's also try as best we can to, to strike a, a pluck, a psychological chord, which was really inter interesting to us because like on the emotional side and, you know, as far as jump scares are concerned, that's great. But when we're dealing with issues of race in America, so much of that as it relates to, the black experience is, is as psychological as it is physical, as it is spiritual, um, environmental, and all of those issues we wanted to lean into, lean into fully and, and horror seemed like a really, um, it's, it seemed like a genre that had the most options for us in terms of being able to explore with this particular subject. Um, and Justin, same thing. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, I never actually thought about making a horror movie. Mm -hmm. it just like kind of didn't dawn on me that I could do that as a black person, which is, you know, odd. Uh, but that's just the truth. And when I began thinking about the movie, I realized that was actually the only thing that was holding me back. In fact, I love horror movies and I love specifically like outside of like the slasher genre. I love psycho thrillers. I, you know, Hitchcock really started this genre with psycho. Um, there've obviously been like, you know, thrillers before that, but this very specific kind of thriller where it, it has supernatural elements that we're not sure if they're real or not. And we're, we're stuck in, you know, a, a very vulnerable woman's head. And there's all of these obsessions um, that come from the filmmaker that surround her world. That, that, that kind of vein of movie, um, I just felt like, boy, that would be, really interesting to do something like that from a black point of view um, and to, you know, imbue it with my obsessions as a gay black man. Like what kind of horror movie am I going to make if I pour my obsessions into it? Um, and, you know, just as a filmmaker, like you just can't find a genre where you can be more free. I mean, you can do absolutely nutball stuff in a movie like this and still have it be grounded, still have it be based on the psychological uh, terror like Gerard was talking about. Um, and, you know, and have audiences accepted. I mean, what genre can you do that in but this? 
Uh, and Justin brought up an interesting point that I wanted to toss to uh, Gerard and Christopher, because like you guys are coming from this background of working with social issues, social campaigns. Uh, for you guys, and as you guys started this career in filmmaking, did you ever, I guess, did you guys ever expect that the first movie you guys made would be a horror film? Or uh, was that, a, or was that sort of, a, or, or did that come to you, come out, come out, come out of surprise to you? No, I think it, it happened organically. I mean, the idea for the film came from a, a nightmare that that Gerard had, and I, I don't think we went to went into it with any strategic kind of thinking. You know, which kind of genre should our first movie be? It was just this is the idea. This is what we're going to go with. And yeah, I mean, this is the first script we ever wrote, the first movie we ever directed, and. And it just kind of ended up being what it being what it was. We were true to the source material, which was, you know, Gerard's nightmare. And on that note, I think I want to sort of cut to a clip from Antebellum, which comes at a point in the movie where Janelle Monáe's character, Veronica Henley, is talking to another uh, captive on this slave plantation. So let's roll the clip, please. You're from Virginia, right? I'm from North Carolina. Look, I can't do this. Whatever you're doing, I can't do it. Listen to me. Wherever you came from before here, you need to forget about it. Mm -mm. That is not possible for me. What are we doing? What is the plan? Uh, welcome back to our Black Horror panel. Um, and before we talk about Antebellum, I just want to welcome our other panelists who just joined us, Rusty Cundiff, the co-director and co-writer and executive producer of Tales from the Hood 3, the latest installment in the Tales from the Hood anthology franchise, which premiered on Sci-Fi on October 17th. Welcome, Rusty. Welcome, and apologies for being late. No worries, no worries. Uh, so, uh, Gerard and Christopher, I'm curious, because uh, you said this, this this movie came from a dream that Gerard had. I'm curious, uh, did you guys, I guess, encounter any sort of obstacles sort of pitching this movie, I guess? Was this was this a hard sell? Um, you know, I, I think because we went into it without uh, any preconceived idea as it, as it relates to Hollywood. Uh, all we cared about was being true to the art and being true to our vision. And so um, I, I, maybe it's because we were the, it was our first day at school and we, we beat up the bully because we didn't know they were the bully. Uh, we had, <laughs> it was quite competitive to get our movie. Um, and so for us toward the end of that funnel and those conversations, what became increasingly important or crucial was that we land with a studio partner that would actually be courageous enough to work side by side with us from the very beginning until we actually got what we wanted on the screen. Whenever you're saying something in Hollywood where you don't ask for permission from the culture, the cultural gatekeepers, or when you're not asking permission from uh, the right wing of sort of um, white America, then chances are you're going to be attacked by multiple sides when you're trying to make something like antebellum. Christopher and I come from a social justice background, so we considered a badge of honor. And so we really wanted to get what we, what we envisioned on the screen so that we could have a meaningful conversation. We weren't looking to create something milk toast. We weren't looking to create something that was entertainment for entertainment's sake. We are incredibly concerned about the world that we live in and a host of urgent issues that seem to be enveloping America, metastasizing across the country at a breakneck pace. And so for us, it was crucial that we get this medicine out and we bury the medicine within the thrill and we could have a conversation about it and move toward meaningful action as it relates to race in America. And I mean, this movie doesn't shy away from depicting uh, the horrors of slavery. Um, uh, and for you, I guess, what reaction were you hoping to sort of elicit out of the audience? And then I guess now, that, and also now that the movie's out, have you, I guess, what has the audience reaction been, I guess? Well, we're, we're on our third week at number one in the country. 
um, and the conversations are are what they are, um, and they're 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 big conversations that have people wanting to continue to see what um, what all of the fuss is about as it relates to antebellum. Uh, one thing that we couldn't do, or there are a lot of things that we that we refuse to do, but at the top of that list would be serving as co-conspirators in the erasure of our own history. And so the brutality of slavery and what that means, uh, it was important that we at least give you some idea of what that experience must have been, but we don't even begin, it's like, it's like the tip of the proverbial iceberg when you really, in the research that we did, it doesn't even come close to the brutality that, that you know, our ancestors faced at that time. Uh, but I think that what we're trying to say in it is that as much as, as you think things are changing, it's that the, the white supremacy is simply hibernating, evolving, and preparing to attack in a way that you might least expect at a time that you would least expect it. Um, and you mentioned about sort of uh, putting this medicine um, inside the thrill. And I wanted to open this, this next question up to the entire panel because... Uh, I mean, how do you all as filmmakers sort of approach these movies that are very much dealing with important social issues, but then also are movies that have to have some form of entertainment value? How do you navigate that balance? And I guess, uh, Rusty, let's start with you. Um, well, I mean, it was interesting hearing what uh, Christopher and Gerard were saying, uh, even though I came in late on it, but I could hear <laughs> in his, their commentary some of the same issues that Darren and I have faced um, with Tales from the Hood, all the various iterations of it, which is, you know, you kind of just have to go with your gut and go with what you believe because you're going to get some pushback. I mean, I, I know at least we did. Um, you get pushback politically, you get pushback uh, from a social standpoint. Um, in Tales 2, they want us us to take out some things because we were making commentary on Trump and they didn't want to make commentary on Trump. Uh, Tales one, they wanted us to take out some things because they didn't like how we were dealing with the police. Um, in all cases, we just kind of push forward with what we wanted to do. We were fortunate enough to have Spike as an executive producer. So when they tried to make us do something, we would go to Spike and say, Spike, tell them that we're not going to do it. Uh, and no one wanted to upset Spike. So we, we, we got to keep a lot of things in that we wanted. But I think that they're right. You really just have to go with what the story is that you want to tell and let the, you know, the consequences be damned in a, in a lot of ways. And the, the other thing I've noticed um, when we go and do tales, when we, when we go out and we screen it for an audience and you do like Q&A, we have these issues where you'll you'll hear people say, why are you putting all this social stuff in there? Just do something that's scary or just do something that's fun. And I, I think, you know, they're right. If, if you have something in your heart that you really want to get out and talk about, you just have to put it in there. There's tons of horror movies. There's tons of movies that deal with absolutely nothing that if you want to see, you can go out and see that. And you know, if you want something that has something of value in it, then you come and see something like Bad Hair, Antebellum, the list goes on and on. There's, there's all, there's, but those are the important things. And, and I, I will just say this really quickly, and I've said it like too many times um, in other places, but films can change behavior. Uh, after Tales 1, I've had more than a few people come up to me and say, I stopped gangbanging because of that movie. I've had people come up and talk to me about how uh, the Walter story in that movie, which, uh, you know, was kind of a, 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 a uh, an abuse story, wife abuse, child abuse, how that was very helpful for people who went through it, which was kind of concerning to me because no one can crumble up their monster in a piece of paper. But film really can change the way we view the world. I don't think it's an accident the 24 had, was it David Haysbert? It was a, a, mm -hmm. a president, black president. And after that, Obama came. And yeah. even before that, Tiny Lister was a black president in that crazy movie with uh, Chris Tucker. I can't remember the name of it. So, you know, there's something and, to film. And since we're running out of time, I want to wrap up with another question. So what's interesting about a lot of these movies, um, Antebellum and Bad Hair, in many ways, 
deal with the past, bad hair send the past, and Bellum don't want to spoil the twist. Um, but for you, I guess, what do you view as sort of the the next step in the black horror genre? Should we, I guess, do you guys hope that we start looking towards the future in some way? I'm curious to hear your thoughts on that. I I think that that horror or any genre for that matter for black filmmakers, I think that what we should be thinking about is the sky's the limit. That we shouldn't have these these limitations in terms of how we want to express ourselves and the stories that we want to tell and how we want to tell them. I think that that black art so often, I think that our art in particular is the most policed. I think it's over critiqued. I think that we are not there. There is an expectation around what we say, how we say it, when we say it, that um, that has a, a difficulty rating that is much more arduous than what other filmmakers and artists have to go through. But I also think that that's a part of what makes the art so special. And I hope that in the future, when I think about bad hair and tales and even antebellum to a certain extent, you know, these, these stories that have the audacity to express themselves in the way that they want to be expressed, that they're not asking for permission from anyone, that they're just, the art at a certain point, I think all the filmmakers will probably agree with me, that the art at a certain point takes on a life of its own and it wants to express itself in the way that it wants to express itself. And it starts to tell you where to go. And I think that that hopefully by us doing movies and shows and things like this, that we're opening up uh, the world to say, let's stop placing limitations on the sort of stories that we can tell and how we should tell them. Uh, and just Justin and Rusty, any final thoughts before we wrap up? I'm getting the yeah, one mean, minute. I mean, look, first of all, I got to hats off to Rusty, man, because Tells from the Hood is one of the reasons why I thought I could even do this. You know what I mean? Like, the truth is, is like, you talk about the future. I think antebellum, I think it, in, in your posters, it's like the past is present. The mm -hmm. fact is, is that in this country, we are not allowed, we are not shown the way to really confront our past. And so it stays with us. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a tightrope to walk because in these movies, we're bringing up trauma and audiences in a way that they've never experienced in a movie before because I've never seen a movie with people like them in it dealing with things that are actually horrifying in their real lives. And so in that way, black movies are experimental. We're at the very beginning. Who knows, you know, where our real involvement, our real engagement in film and in this genre is gonna take it. Um, I, I, I don't think there's any way to anticipate it. I think, uh, you know, I think what Gerard was saying is absolutely right. I think um, we need the freedom to just get in that thing. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. and, experiment uh, and, it and figure out where it's going awesome on that note because we have literally 10 seconds left thank you all for joining me um please everyone please watch all three movies tales from the hood 3 premieres on sci-fi on october 17th bad hair on hulu on october 23rd and antebellum is currently available on video on demand and thank you everyone for joining us for this panel